Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the teaching and learning call for November 18th, 2020. Um, do we have any announcements? I guess since Wilma isn't here, we don't have any announcements. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, it looks like from the chat, the biggest announcement is that winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so I can channel uh, Wilma a little bit. So yesterday she posted the uh, the videos from what we're calling SakaiCon 2020, oh. also known as the Sakai Virtual Conference. So, uh, so there's there's a link there for those, and there was uh, I'll just convey that there was a, a very brief conversation about um, about what to do about uh, Sakai Camp because we obviously can't be in person this year. So we talked about that a little bit at the the core team meeting yesterday, uh, you know, and just to the extent of saying, well, we we anticipate having. Uh, some sort of extended PMC plus meeting uh, around the same time late January, but obviously not in person. So uh, all that's still being worked out, but uh, roughly that time frame is still the right time frame for the for those conversations. And Josh, do you happen to know if the um, the survey for the SakaiCon is still open? I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Let me see if I'm I can sure that I talked to Wilma about it yesterday, and I don't think she said that she closed it. She was she was hoping for some more feedback. So I think if folks have not yet uh, responded, now is a great time for that. Yeah. Let me see if I can find her email. Well, no, not this instant. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. No, no, no. <laughs> um, late, later today, after this call, would be a great opportunity for that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Charles. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Did you find it? I did. Okay. Um, and he's posting it in the etherpad. Thanks, Josh. My pleasure. I'm not sure how long that survey is staying open, but yeah, if you... Do it soon before you forget. Again. <laughs> Not this instant. <laughs> right. If there's anyone posting feedback before 11 o'clock, you will be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's no further announcements. Um, <clears throat> we'll introduce Josh Wilson from Longsight, who doesn't really need any introduction to the people that are here. Um, he's going to be talking about Sakai Roadmap 2022 to 2024. And do I need to give you presenter? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, so I think, you know, could we share the document and screen share? Yes. Um, I put the put the link to the roadmap document in the etherpad. I'll put it in the chat as well. So you guys can can go directly. If there are folks who want to see it, then we can do that. Josh, just for the sake of the recording, it's probably a good idea. Oh, share. yeah, it probably is a good idea. Um, okay. So, oh, all right. So Charles has given me a uh, moderator and presenter priv. So let me let me get that screen share going. Hold on one second. The pressure, the pressure. All right. Ta-da, we have a screen share. All right. Hey. So thanks for thanks all for taking some time to give me some feedback. This is the this is the third time we've been around this bend amazing to think about so this is our our third annual three-year roadmap this year covering 2022 through 2024 as charles mentioned and the the intent as always is to 
get us organized around what we want to accomplish in the next few versions of Sakai to have uh, an open decision making process that involves lots of people as many as many stakeholders as want to be involved and uh, to make it so that we don't have to reopen decisions on a regular basis. I know that had been a, a feature of our conversations in, in past years. So the ability of the of setting the roadmap over these months is you know one in which we can then say, okay, let's let's go forth and do what it is we plan to do. Uh, it also has the side benefit of allowing institutions who wish to get behind some aspect of, of Sakai development to know what's coming and to do that. And institutions who don't want to get behind it but want to take advantage of it to also know what's coming. So it's good for all those reasons. So we are in, uh, the process is generally like this. In uh, October, early November, I confer with uh, folks at Longsite uh, and folks on the, uh, the roadmap steering team and I can I can name off those folks. Uh, I need need to get the list, but there I'm very grateful to those folks who provide some some initial comments. And you can you can see most of them in the comment stream on the document already. So then there's a, a presentation of the roadmap for initial feedback at the Sakai virtual conference, um, which happened last week. Uh, then there is then I, I tend to take it around to as many of the working groups as I can possibly manage to do. So teaching and learning and UX and accessibility and marketing and core team uh, and, and others if I can manage it. Uh, hey, Wilma. Um, so this is the you guys are the first of the working groups to have an opportunity for feedback. This is the same document from last week. But as you can see, the comment stream is greatly advanced. And I think that it, it's it's interesting to seek feedback from you guys now that a bunch of people have already weighed in. So from from my perspective, I think our, our job here is to curate the stuff that's in 2022 at this moment because there's too much for us to do and we need to make some decisions. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's notable where people have placed their attention and where they haven't. Uh, you know, so there's been a lot of comments, for example, on uh, on achievements and a lot of comments on site info, uh, but not all that much on greater improvements. I don't know if that's meaningful or not. You know, so I think that, you know, I'll I'll talk through this a little bit, but you can see where there's been effort and intention. And I would definitely encourage people to put comments in the document, put comments in the chat, uh, you know, speak up about your thoughts. I'll try and uh, I'll try and capture as many of these as I possibly can. I think that if you, uh, if I could get your help, uh, if you could err on the side of commenting in the document so that as many comments as possible are in one place and they're transparent to people who look at this document later, that would be super helpful. Um, so, so with with that, let me let me talk you through this a little tiny bit, uh, and I'll try not to do too much of that, and then open the floor for your feedback. So, as in the past, we've broken aspects of the roadmap into four threads. We've got new features, we've got feature improvements, we've got technical improvements, and we've got infrastructure upgrades. So uh, looking at the, the, the 2022 column, and also the, the other thing to, be, to note about this roadmap is that it, 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 like many academic plans that relate to technology, the first year of the plan is, is uh, well-defined, the second year is fairly well-defined, the third year is not so well-defined and fairly opportunistic. So, so what, what have we got from a new feature perspective uh, currently on the roadmap in 2022, recognizing that what we need to do is to cull this down, this list. So we've got new global navigation. Uh, that is mostly designed, not yet implemented. We have uh, new forms, tables, and tabs UI. That is probably half to 60% designed, not yet implemented. Uh, we've got new forms. There's been a lot of conversation about how in a, in a COVID world with, with a lot of online courses, Forums are where discussions take place, and perhaps we ought to put some effort into making that, uh, you know, a, a better venue for discussion than it currently is. Program level analytics, that's something that uh, many have been interested in, although there hasn't been a lot of comment on this yet. Um, uh, Marist has sponsored some of this work and has put forth some requirements. So that's uh, the, the work has not been begun, but it's been discussed. There's the achievement service, which was meant to gamify Sakai a little bit to allow for granular tracking of uh, who had done what in courses so that students could conceivably get badges for being the first to post in a course or the first to get to 10 responses. You know, the, the, the thought was to be able to provide all of those different kinds of capabilities and to integrate with third party badging providers. 
unified messaging was something that was, there aren't a lot of comments on it, but there was a lot of conversation about it at the uh, at SakaiCon 2020. So this was the idea that many tools send out messages and how can we bring those together into a consistent interface? How can we uh, make the messaging capabilities consistent across the tools so that they all have similar capabilities? How can we uh, provide a one-stop place where people can go to get all of their messages from the various tools? And uh, also, how can we uh, add on some sort of a mobile app that would consume that message stream and provide it to students and faculty in, in, a, in a mobile friendly way? Smart notifications, uh, which is called by some of our competitors as intelligent agents, is something that's been a conversation and that's come up for Wilma and me in some of our conversations with perspectives. Um, you know, so the, the question there is how do we um, how do we use activity data in Sakai to let faculty know programmatically that a student hasn't logged in in some days or to uh, you know let students know that possibly they're at risk in some way there's a lot of a lot of this has to do with, with student success but not all of it uh, some of the conversations have been around uh, you know how do you you know how can we programmatically create groups and courses of students that meet certain certain criteria based upon their their, their in-course activities so these are all the kinds of things that would fall under the heading of smart notifications and a bunch of schools have asked for a Microsoft Teams integration. So that's what's possibly on the list in new features and feature improvements. There's a calendar UI replacement that's been planned but not implemented. There are workflow improvements that have been uh, worked on. Uh, we worked on them at Sakai Camp. It's, the UX team continues to work on these now. Uh, so these are all possibilities and there's been some, you know, there's a fair amount of support in the comment stream for prioritizing these. There's a, a substantial conversation about site info. I was hoping for some easy way for people to be able to join sites, thinking about the, the non-academic educators that Martin Ramsey spoke about last week. Uh, but the comment stream is, uh, is, is more wide ranging in what could be done to site info. Improvements to search, improvements to grader. Uh, moving on to technical improvements, there's a whole lot of talk about Samago performance improvements. Uh, and also Adam made a point about including Samigo's uh, open standard support, which I think is a really good one. There's the grading service, which we have been meaning to implement for a couple of years. There's improvements to QA testing, although Michael Green makes the point that perhaps automating QA testing shouldn't be where we place our efforts, um, you know, because that doesn't seem to be where a lot of the energy is in QA right now. Uh, there's a backend service for unified messaging, uh, replacing reusable components with open source accessible replacements. Uh, there's been a, a fair bit of conversation about Canvas compatibility for LTI integrations. Uh, Dr. Chuck has brought this up in a few different settings. Alan Regan suggested rubrics improvements, both for functionality and, and reliability. And on the infrastructure upgrade, there's our ongoing effort to remove technical debt. So upgrading tools that use older libraries, upgrading our frequently used libraries, uh, et cetera. So then in 2023, potentially, we look forward to more improvements around messaging, a date wizard that might uh, allow for more programmatic uh, adjustments to course dates for thinking about courses that have been copied over from past semesters, how to make it easier for faculty to change those dates all in one pop. Um, there is, uh, we've, we've talked about doing new lessons, although in some ways the conversation, as you can see in the stream, is uh, is now one in which we might get behind Dayton to uh, to do more improvements to lessons uh, in 2022 instead of maybe doing a rewrite in 2023. Potentially cloud storage improvements, looking at feature improvements, improvements to Grader and Gradebook, to rubrics, more cloud storage improvements on the technical side, more reusable components, um, more uh, use of uh, web components in a in a more in a sort of more flexible JavaScript front end, uh, more library replacements and upgrades in the infrastructure side. So I'll, I'll stop there. That's a, that's a whole lot. Um, and I would love to start with a couple of questions to ask you guys, uh, starting with a focus on, uh, let's start with 2022. And uh, my question to you is, uh, it's a two part question. What is most important here and what's missing?
Yeah, sorry, Dave, it is a loaded question, but trying to start somewhere. One way to think about this is as you look at the, the items that have been commented on, uh, are those items that are also important to you? Are there items that are un, that have not yet been commented on that you find to be important that ought to be brought to the fore? Josh, it's Adam. I don't want to dwell on Samago too much, but I did bring it up because um, Samago standards compatibility is lacking when compared to other LMSs, and I feel like it's been somewhat neglected. And as we've shifted to, to remote learning, uh, remote assessment has become very important for my institution. Um, I'm a little concerned bringing it up because it feels a bit like a briar patch. I remember two years ago when uh, Earl had completed work on refactoring assignments that he was gung-ho to refactor uh, tests and quizzes in a similar way and build an alternate assessment instrument, which potentially could build towards feature compatibility. And we haven't gone to that, but I also know that Samago has huge technical debt in terms of capabilities, in terms of you know, the technology that it's built on. And I'm a little fearful having that be in 2022 for fear that it's going to become a time suck. But I also realize that it needs to be addressed. So I'm just going to throw that to the group for possible discussion because for me personally, it's a pain point, but I want to find out if other people feel similarly. It's a great question. I'd love to hear what others think. Thank you for bringing it up. Sorry, but can one of you repeat the actual question? Ah, so I, I think so. So Adam, I think is, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can summarize and see how well I do and uh, playing it back. So what I heard was that uh, Samago is, is increasingly key in a moment when we've got more online courses and uh, more online assessment. There's a lot of technical debt. So on the, on the one hand, Placing our efforts there is is a useful place and an, and, and an important place for, for us to think about. But uh, potentially, it's uh, it's such a complex piece of code that we might lose ourselves in there. Adam, right. how, how is that? Yeah. Is that is that, is yeah. that most of what you wanted to get after? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I I was maybe it was what you were saying that was prompting me. It's so funny how I attribute other people's thoughts to my own. <laughs> uh, origination. Um, I, I but, used to work uh, for someone for whom that that was her primary mode. Like she would seed thoughts in the organization, <laughs> and when other people would run with them, she would feel like she was she had been a success in getting it done. Right, right. Um, I was just thinking, probably because Adam was saying it, that um, I hear a lot here at UVA uh, from various instructional designers and people who support teaching and learning technologies that Samago is almost too complex. We have tried to accommodate every single use case and, and we've created a lot of bloat and a lot of complication and it's almost impossible to test anything in that tool now because there's just so much going on and it requires, you know, uh, testing across the board of all the features to see if there's any problems. It's ridiculous. Um, and so uh, a lot of people are looking at other integrated tools for uh, to simplify testing and um, for features that um, aren't even in the current tests and quizzes. So I, I really don't think adding more features is where we should be get looking. Um, Maybe we need to be looking at a simple test feature um, and stop adding stuff to tests and quizzes. It's already way too complicated. <laughs> That's my opinion. Well, I, I think that what we're talking about here is not adding stuff to it but fixing it so it, what's there works. And I think that's what's most important to me. Um, you know, the um, the workflow issues, as Charles is mentioning in the um, in the chat, uh, are problems, and the users overwriting their work with multiple tabs is a serious problem. And I think, to me, the the most serious problem that should be addressed in Sakai is session handling, and this is all tools, 
every single tool, users can overwrite their work and lose their work and destroy things by opening two tabs. And people today open multiple browser tabs and have like and 10 tabs yeah, open at once. It's a good point, Tiffany. And that's really important when we're talking about student work, especially on a high stakes exam. That's just really where, where the, where the rubber meets the road, right? That's the really the most important part of the puzzle is if a student can overwrite work or in an essay or whatever by having another tab open, even though we've warned them not to and all the honor code issues with that, then we're really in hot water with our instructors. Yeah. So this, it does require a very significant rewrite of the back end of Samago that developers are afraid to touch. And I understand that, but I think that technical debt and session handling needs to be rewritten and it needs to be focused on before any of the other stuff, even before the UI stuff. And I I have to say Samago's UI is tough and there are bad workflows, yes. But I think the session handling and users losing their work with multiple tabs and the back and forward buttons on their browser is the most serious issue in Sakai today. Well, so this is, Tiffany raises a really good point. I am curious of the folks on this call, um, how many of you agree that session handling is the biggest deal? If you if, if you feel that way, could you put a plus one in the chat? That would be good to know. Apparently everyone feels that way. I, I will say that at a recent long site staff meeting, Sam and Earl had a conversation about, uh, you know, what would be the least invasive way to address that in Samago? And Earl has some ideas. So, um, you know, that's it's vaporware until someone does something with it, right? Um, but on the other hand, it's you know at least people are starting to to think about how to solve this without you know ripping Samago apart. I mean, I think a rewrite is not in the cards. Uh, but uh, you know, there there's also the question of of a simpler testing engine. Um, so what do what do folks think about that? I mean, so there there used to be one, right? Wilma, what was it called? Sorry, I was in the middle, in the middle of typing something. Go ahead. <laughs> what was that? Oh, what, what was the name of the simpler uh, assessment engine that used to be in? Oh, uh, Nimi. Yeah. Yeah, that was um by Etudes. They had Nimi, and they also had modules, and I think there was another tool. Um, so that one has been abandoned pretty much, um, but the code is there. They said you guys can take it and run with it if you want. It's a very simple um, test engine by comparison to Samago. It doesn't have nearly the, the capability, and it would take a significant effort, I think, to probably um, bring it up to the version that we're running now. So um, it'd certainly be easier than starting from scratch, but it would um, it would be um, a lift to get it to. Now, there are a number of, of simpler testing engines that are available as LTIs. Uh, you know, we have instructors who are using Gradescope now. Um, there's, um, you know, for survey type stuff, there's a couple of survey type engines. Um, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank on the names, but uh, there are a lot of simpler engines out there right now. And I don't know that developing another simpler engine is the way to go. I think we need to fix stuff that we have. Um, you know, and if somebody wants something simpler, then there, there are LTIs available for that, right? Um, you know, Gradescope's new testing engine is is very basic, multiple choice and uh, kind of thing. Um, so, but it handles well, grading in a much more uh, robust way than tests and quizzes does. Yeah, some some elements of it mm -hmm. do, but not oh. the multiple choice uh, element. So the the auto graded sections of it, um, yeah. there are some. It's very basic. I think that's a really good point, Tiffany, and, and I, so I withdraw my suggestion to develop something new in Sakai to meet those needs. They're, they're I, probably already out there. I, I would also point out that if we can kind of sort of simultaneously improve some of the workflow things that would 
make it easier for people that aren't doing a lot of advanced things to set things up would also go some way to to alleviating that problem as well. I have to agree. Um, I've been working with um, John Buckingham from Pepperdine on um, some rewriting some language uh, for the settings workflow. Um, and adding some language to make things easier to understand and follow. And, you know, yes, it adds more text, but I think that's a page where it's actually needed um, so that people can understand what's going on and how to use it. And I think there are definitely a lot of places in Samago where we could simplify workflows by, um, you know, hiding things behind uh, sort of a more advanced features option. Um, and just presenting a, a less, a slightly cleaner interface. So I think there are opportunities there uh, for improvement to keep the, the features that our more advanced users want and yet, um, you know, make it better, a better experience for those who are in, in newcomers uh, to the tool. So I'm, I'm curious, is the, are Samago workflows uh, among the gnarly workflows that are being addressed by the UX group? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's kind of two pieces to this. So there's the performance issue in Samago, which is um, things like session handling and and concurrent, you know, usage and you know the use of question pools and queries on the database, that whole bit. Um, and then there's the UI piece, which has to do with the complexity of the tool as presented to the user when they go in to, to set something up. Um, so I think those are really kind of, they're certainly related, but they're separate pieces. Um, you could conceivably make the UI friendlier without touching the back end or vice versa. So yes, that's, being, that's right. Being but, mindful of time, I, you know, so noted that uh, Samago is a big area of emphasis. So that I, I very clearly take that away. Um, are there, you know, I, I want not to take more time than is allotted in this meeting. So Charles, I guess I'll just lean on you to, to cut this off when you think the right moment is. But given that we're approaching that moment, um, are there other uh, aspects of this document that you see that you would, uh, you know, are there are there improvements that you find to be lower priority? Are there improvements that you want to, to call out and, and bump up as higher priority? What about, what, what about messaging? So, what do we, sorry, Stephanie, you go ahead. Well, yeah, we do have a lot of uh, requests from students for better messaging and, and stuff like that. Uh, so that, that is a high priority for students. Um, I think uh, another piece that uh, that is of, of great interest to, uh, at least from my perspective, is the ability to import content from other systems, uh, not just in Samago, but also in terms of LTIs, um, you know, deeper, better integration uh, for reuse of materials um, is something that, uh, that instructors really want and need. Anyone else want to weigh in on that further? Uh, let's see. So, um, w um, looking at the chat I, here. I just um, wanted to, to ask a question. I mean, there are certain things on here that people haven't talked about this go round, um, but they got a lot of attention the last time we did the roadmap. So I'm wondering if people aren't commenting because they think it's a given that it needs to be there or if they aren't commenting because it's no longer a priority. Um, for example, document annotation. Nobody's really talked about that, but that was like, a lot of what we heard from people the last time we did the roadmap. So I'm, I'm curious if the lack of comment on some of these items is reflective of, you know, current attention focus, or if it's more that we've kind of, we're over it. 
I mean, I think that um, those things are needed and wanted, uh, but I think that at least from our user's perspective, the thing I've heard the most is they just want to use the back and forward button in their browser without their stuff getting lost. <laughs> um, I mean, really, like I've, I've heard that literally from multiple instructors. I just want to be able to use the normal functions of my browser that I'm used to using in every other system and not have my, my work be destroyed. <laughs> it does seem to me from a document annotation perspective that uh, that is, you know, if we, in this moment, right, we need to be doing things to Sakai to help uh, make feedback easier to deliver. So that seems like a no brainer to me. Um, you know, it, it fits with the comments that we heard earlier about how uh, assessment is really important, uh, especially in a fully online or a partially online setting. Yeah, I wasn't advocating that we remove it. I was just wondering why it wasn't getting any love. <laughs> yeah, I want to know too. Well, this is Dave Evil, and, um, and I was sort of to switch things. Um, I mentioned the program level analytics. Well, that's something I think a lot of our institutions would love, or at least my institution, I think, would love it. I don't think we're clamoring for that to come right out of the LMS. We we post you know, post uh, process all of that sort of stuff. Um, and honestly, I don't think my programs, with so much change that's happened because of COVID, are in a place where they would be able to, you know, really put their hands on the need for program level analytics right now. We're just trying to sort of, you know, figure out what's coming next and how to sort of cope with changes in terms of pivots and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm not saying program level analytics are less important, but um, I think they might. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. It continues to be something that is asked about in RFPs and RFQs, um, you know, the, the ability to be able to provide those kinds of record, re reporting capabilities from the LMS. Uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, we, you know, lots of us make very good arguments about how, uh, you know, there are other ways to do that that are better. You know, it's, it's right. hard to square that circle. Right. Um, I mean, one thing, one thing I think that, you know, so we, it, it's tough, right? Because we need to think about how to make Sakai as functional as possible for the needs that we have in this moment. Um, you know, but I think we also need to make sure that it's meeting some of those other needs that institutions have that that tend to encourage them to look around, you know, because we won't, you know, long term, we won't meet our goals as a community if we if we can't uh, make Sakai something that, you know, doesn't call out for attrition in that way, you know. It, it sounds to me as though, and um, and this is just based primarily on the discussion today, but um, it sounds like people are more interested in fixing things that are already in there and making them work really solid, as opposed to adding a lot of new things that don't currently exist. I think I'd agree with that. Yeah, it seems like that formulation is, is getting is getting a lot of love. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of plus ones that, in the comments. Mm -hmm. That that's exactly it. Uh, just just making what's there work uh, well uh, is really what we should be focusing on. I think. And you know that's something that I brought up in a in a previous Open Aperio meeting where um, someone was mentioning you know how you know our, our customers want new shiny things but really <laughs> tacking on new shiny things on top of a bunch of technical debt results in the problems that we have now no. yeah i mean i don't think we can afford to just stop adding new features. I don't think that would realistically happen. I mean, people would just develop them anyway and contribute them back later. But I do think that if we were going to kind of 
weigh the percent effort put towards new new versus fixing that we need to more heavily weight the fixing of things um, maybe like you know a 60 40 split or something like that and there's there's an argument that could be made that some of the ui improvements uh fall in the category of fixing things as oh, opposed yeah. to in the category Definitely. of something new it's not necessarily fixing a performance issue but it's fixing a usability issue which makes That's an even right. bigger impact on the end user yeah usability and accessibility issues i would argue are are very important um i think students uh, on a student perspective dave um in terms of what they'd like is uh, more notifications uh, and um, and better workflows for submission of things, <laughs> and and also um, you know there, I guess more notifications that are in their control rather than the instructor's control. Like you know right now <laughs> instructors can decide whether or not to notify students when they do things, but. Um, I think a lot of times students just want to know when a grade's been released or something like that. I mean, Dave, my answer to your question would be no, I don't think we have that data. Um, I mean, so, you know, so then we, we fall back on what you guys know anecdotally from your institutions, you know, which is, you know, absolutely in line with what, with what Tiffany just reported. Yeah, I mean, um, from our student focus groups, most of them said they wanted uh, more notifications. Uh, they also tended to um, focus on the fact that it was less a problem with the LMS than with how the instructors were using it. Uh, so in that case, lessons um, improvements may be uh, a good place to look for um, you know, helping instructors create better sites um, and more uniform sites. I mean, that's that came out also of a, um, a survey of students with disabilities from, I think it was Educause or Chronicle, um, did a major study. Uh, and in, in those, uh, sur those big surveys, they also found that instructors' use or lack of use of the LMS was the, the um, yeah, exactly, regardless of LMS, Dave. Yeah. Um, was the the main uh, problem that students had with um, with technology in there? Yeah, course. it's interesting that you bring that up because we've heard the exact same thing. Like some of the um, uh, focus groups and presentations that we've done at various um, institutions, um, there have been a few with students involved, and and um, they will usually ask for things that Sakai already does. And the reason they don't know that it does it is because the faculty aren't using it that way. Um, and uh, so, yeah, a lot of it is is sort of a, a training and education um, related as, as opposed to like new features. So, it, I mean, it's important to note that, that Dayton continues to uh put their effort behind lessons which is really great to hear i mean so there's a there's a bit about lessons in the comments stream where uh, there's a faculty member from northwest state community college offering some ideas and i looped in david bauer and he essentially has made a commitment to continue to improve lessons but he wants community feedback on how on, on where to place their efforts i mean they, they know what they know from dayton but he wants to take a broader view of things so I think if there are folks who want to be involved in that conversation, you know, definitely make yourself known. Sounds like a teaching and learning call subject. Yeah, that would be a mm -hmm. good one. We should get them on the schedule. Um, one other thing we might want to think about doing since we're sort of lamenting the lack of, um, you know, real you know, survey data on students is, is do a survey. Um, we would obviously need help from a variety of institutions to get the survey out, but maybe if we developed a community survey on what are the highest priority student-facing features, um, that would give us some valuable information. 
I have to say that's a gigantic pile of work and year upon year student responses to surveys go down for all sorts of reasons. Um, I, you know, I, I would love to have the data. There's no doubt about it, but I, I, I worry that we, that that will be a rabbit hole that won't really buy us all that much. I could be wrong. Yeah, Dave's commenting that they may be over surveyed right now. Yeah, that is true. There have been a, a billion surveys going out right now about the COVID and everything else. So I just wish we had the data is all. I mean, we'd probably be better off with some, you know, if we want to go down this road, uh, some a really smart qualitative strategy. You know, but it, it definitely requires participation from lots of institutions. You know, the the recruitment of students largely happens at the institution, even if the administration of the focus groups and the gathering of the data and the and the analysis of the data could be done, you know, centrally by, you know, someone. So I'm I'm curious if uh, I want to come back to messaging for a second. You know, because that was something that, that got a lot of attention in the, in the, in the last cycle. Um, you know, we've we've heard from a few of you that, that students would like it, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a tepid endorsement. Um, I'm curious if, if folks have other comments about um, improvements related to unified messaging. Wow, that's some serious silence. A few people typing. Uh, Dave asked, "What would you, what would unified messaging look like?" I mean, so I think that uh, we we've been envisioning it as some sort of a messaging hub in Sakai uh, with a with a messaging service that goes behind it, so that uh, none of the tools would themselves message; they would just plug into the messaging service. Um, and then that that would that would handle the communications in, in the back end. Yeah, and then a, a mobile sort of app like a, could consume the data from that service. Yeah, some sort of a user preferences um, area where they could, you know, elect what channels they want to be notified in and um, how often and you know things like that, so that they would have a little bit more control over where and when they're notified. And I, I think they'd like that too on a more granular basis, like a per site basis. Like I never want to receive notifications from my project sites and I always want to receive notifications from my course sites, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like being able to get notifications just from a specific topic, not like the whole mm -hmm. forum. Yeah, exactly. Or specific aspects, specific tools like. I want notifications, you know, higher in priority from tests and quizzes than I do from, um, you know, maybe resources or something like that. What about uh, Canvas compatibility for LTI integrations? That's something that Dr. Chuck has brought up. I mean, essentially, that's the idea that, uh, you know, a lot, the LTI spec is what it is, but Canvas and, you know, to a lesser extent, Brightspace implements it a little bit differently. They have LTI features, um, you know, that map mostly but not entirely to the spec. So, uh, you know, our adherence to the spec in some ways produces a situation in which integrations don't tend to work um, or sometimes won't because the the vendors are focused on making them work in Canvas. We heard that we heard that a lot in the uh, the inaugural gathering of uh, of EdTech solution providers. You know, they, they would love for their integrations to work across all LMSs and it's a major point of pain for them that they don't. Um, you know, but I think that there would be some security implications. So uh, I'm, I'm curious whether that's something that is of interest to this group. You know, the, the notion of, uh, uh, you know, of the ability to turn on Canvas LTI compatibility in Sakai. Wow, 
that's a that's a, that's a resounding piece of silence there too. All right. Well, I mean, I I think our ahead. instructors do want um, you know more integrations. We get requests for them all the time, um, and you know it it is a problem. I if if Canvas is the the leader who people are creating for, and they're ignoring all the other LMSs. So yes, I I think it would be important to develop. Mm -hmm compatibility for those those LTIs, I guess, if if we have to develop based on our competitor to be able to keep up with the times. I, you know, I don't know. Anyone else want to weigh in? I think if we were able to um, you know, develop a, a, a Canvas, you know, compatibility that would allow us to use pretty much anything that has been made to work with Canvas, I think it would be a, a pretty um, huge win for the amount of effort because you would gain a lot of potential integrations um, by just doing this one thing. But it kind of depends on how complicated it is to develop that piece. And I mean, in terms of just the ability cross compatibility of systems like just importing content uh, that was something that we've had a lot of trouble with this semester where instructors are trying to import assessment questions from canvas and textbook publishers and various other things and our um, samago uh, import is not able to handle those newer formats of assessment um, data uh, qti imports uh, so I think that sort of all of that um, ability to ingest from other systems uh, is a pretty key thing because you get instructors coming from other institutions, from other LMSs, and if they can't import it, that's a, a big failure. So it's it's 1052. I know we're starting to run toward the end of the hour. Um, are there other points that are that are burning that people would like to make things that they want to uh, things on the roadmap that you want to put a plus one to things that you want to uh, advocate for, you know, being being less important? You know, definitely the, the, the biggest takeaway for me from this hour is the notion of uh, a focus on fixing stuff as opposed to adding shiny new things has a lot of support. I'd agree that that's probably the biggest takeaway. So not not shutting off all the comments, but it sounds like the conversation is starting to to bring itself to a logical conclusion. So from a process perspective, um, I'm going to bring I'm going to meet with the UX team next week. I'm going to get on the calendar with the accessibility team and uh, the marketing team over then. So over the next couple of weeks, uh, you know, in the first half of December, I'm going to make the rounds of a bunch of these groups. Uh, I probably will. I probably, but I'm not certain, will iterate this document in December uh, for sure. There'll be an iteration in January, and then the ability, and then I'll I'll do some more casting around, you know, whether it's via email or via meetings, to get some feedback on the iteration, and then there'll be uh, some final discussion and hopefully adoption at uh, whatever meeting replaces Sakai Camp in late January. So I'd expect, uh, you know, I'd be glad to come back to you guys with another iteration in. You know, in four to six weeks, if that's something that that you'd like. Um, so I, I certainly think that more iteration is better. Is that something that you would like to see? Dave Evelyn says yes. All right. Well, so I'll I'll, I'll leave that question up to Charles and. Trisha and Wilma as to whether that, that seems like a valuable thing. Certainly, I'll make the, I'll send the iteration around, you know, to the list so people can comment. 
So thank you guys very much for your feedback. This is, this has been really useful. Thank you. Probably, you, you know, you're, you're not out of time to get to give feedback. So the document is open. You can comment at any point, uh, you know, feel free to feel free to do that. Thank you again. Sorry, Charles, to cut you off. Oh, that's all right. Uh, I was just going to say, I think we, to, to give you time to incorporate any feedback before the, the meeting, we probably have to be the first um, DNL call in January, I would think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we can figure that out later. All right. Um, so um, thank you, Josh. As always, it's good to see what's um, going on and will be going on and being able to provide some input to that. Um, so obviously, we spent the whole time on the roadmap, but I think it was worthwhile to do so. Um, that's in no way meant to be a, a criticism. So we did not get to any jurors today. Um, I think we'll probably plan on that for December 2nd, which is our next meeting. Anybody else have anything else they would like to contribute? Well, if not, I will wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving holiday. You don't have to worry about Sean Foster being here. And I will stop the recording.